Welcome to First Baptist Church of Walnut Creek. Lord, we thank you so much for the privilege that we have to be here today. When we think of the fact that you are not dead in a tomb somewhere, but you are alive and you are alive forevermore, that just thrills our heart because we know that all things are possible through you. And so when we come before you, Lord, we are not writing a letter like to Santa Claus and hoping that we get what we want. We are not asking for the impossible and knowing that, well, if we just wish really hard, we will, may get what we want. It's really not anything about what we want. It's We're asking, Lord, that our minds would be in line with your will, that we would act accordingly, and that, Lord, we would understand what your will is. And we ask, Lord, that our life would start reflecting what your will is. So help us to turn to your word. Help us to spend time in your word so that we might get to know you better. Help us to pray for those around us and lift them up. Lord, continue to conform us to the image of your Son. Make us like Jesus and the characteristics that we see in Him because they are attractive qualities that would be beneficial in our home life, in our work life, our social life. It's hard to turn away kindness, and love, and peace and joy. These are all things that are so desperately needed and needed in our own personal lives. So as we come together and we celebrate this wonderful day, we know that victory is in the future for all of us, regardless of the circumstances and the struggles that we face. We look forward to that day where you will return and call us all to be with you. Lord, please bless the time that we spent together today. In Jesus' name, amen. I'd like to encourage all of you, if you brought your Bible, open your Bibles to Luke, Luke chapter 24. Scripture reading is going to be verse 1 through 12. Now on the first day of the week, very early in the morning, they and certain other women with them came to the tomb bringing the spices which they had prepared. But they found the stone rolled away from the tomb. Then they went in and did not find the body of the Lord Jesus. As it happened, as they were greatly perplexed about this, that behold, two men stood by them in shining garments. Then, as they were afraid and bowed their faces to the earth, they said to them, Why do you seek the living among the dead? He is not here, but is risen. Remember how he spoke to you when he was still in Galilee, saying, The Son of Man must be delivered into the hands of sinful men and be crucified, and the third day rise again. And they remembered his words. Then they returned from the tomb and told all these things to the eleven and to all the rest. It was Mary Magdalene, Joanna, Mary the mother of James, and the other women with them who told these things to the apostles. And their words seemed to them like idle tales, and they did not believe them. But Peter arose and ran to the tomb, and stooping down, he saw the linen cloths lying by themselves, and he departed, marveling to himself at what had happened. The first Sunday after the crucifixion of Jesus, we witnessed the first response to the resurrection, and it is underwhelming. The women go to the tomb to complete the burial tradition, the ritual in which they complete the burial of Jesus. Yet they have no clue how they are going to open the tomb once they arrive. Yet the problem is soon resolved by the shock of seeing the tomb open, and it's replaced with fear as they see two supernatural beings that engage them in conversation. The women are told, He is risen! Remember how he spoke to you when he was still in Galilee? The Son of Man must be delivered into the hands of sinful men and be crucified and the third day rise again. Go tell his disciples. 
How will the disciples respond to this good news? Well, when the women return from the tomb, Mary exclaims, He is risen! And the disciples respond, Nah. What? We can't really believe that because of what a woman says? You mean they're chauvinist? No, it's just... You don't understand what's taking place. A couple of the disciples, as we heard, took off to go investigate. But the rest of them are all cloistered together. They're distraught. They're hurt. A loved one had just died, and yet now these women have come and said, He's risen! They don't say his body has, em- his body has disappeared. They're claiming he is resurrected. Mm. And so the two that go investigate, they discover the tomb is just as the women described. It's open, it's empty, and there's no body. Still, they don't believe. There must be a logical, reasonable answer for this. Maybe the women are just overcome with emotions because they're all on an emotional edge knife. As would we be, and as we are when we are facing the death of a loved one. We are all familiar with death. Maybe it's the death of a cat or the death of a dog, death of a grandparent, death of parents. We know that death will come to us all. And Jesus was walking with his disciples when Martha came to him and said to him, Lord, if you had been here with me, with my brother Lazarus, he wouldn't have died. But even now I know that whatever you ask of God, God will give to you. And Jesus said, your brother will rise again. And Martha was one of those really good Bible students. She was smart. She knew her theology. And she says, yes, I know he will rise again on the last day. And Jesus said, I am the resurrection. I am the life. Do you believe Do you really believe this? Now this is a big question. The word gospel means good news. But good news about what? A husband may sit beside his wife and say, Good news, the kids are in bed. A boss may say, Good news, everybody is getting a bonus. Mary says, Good news, he is risen. Well, that must be good news. It is, for Jesus did something that nobody else has ever done before. Oh, people have been raised from the dead before, but they always die later. Jesus was risen from the dead, never to die again. But how is that even possible? How can he be dead and then alive again? And yet the whole answer is found in who he is. When the Apostle Paul writes to the Corinthians, he says, Moreover, brethren, I declare to you first the gospel. He says, I'm writing the same thing that I shared with you in person, which I preached to you, which you also received, in which you stand, in which you are also saved, if you hold fast to the word which I preached to you, unless, of course, you believed in vain. I mean, you believed without result or You didn't really believe. It's kind of the idea. For I delivered to you, first of all, that which I also received. Meaning the gospel is the direct revelation of God. It's not man's made-up story. That Christ died for our sins according to Scripture, and that he was buried and that he rose again the third day according to the Scripture. And people are asked to believe in something. What are they asked to believe in? It's the object of God's message. Well, what's the object of belief? This is what the good news the Apostle Paul carried with him when he went into the area, the providence, the territory of Galatia. Paul goes in and is asking them to believe in Jesus Christ, in his person, in his work, and who he is. And if we had time to turn to Acts chapter 13, we would see that some believed and some didn't. And those who believed wanted to hear more. 
And those who didn't, they didn't want to hear anything else. It's interesting that those who believe always want more. Can I have some more cake? I like cake. I would like more. But onions? No, I don't even want the first taste of it. You can keep all my share and anybody else's that wants to give it up. But if you believe in Christ, you want more of that. And they did. Easter Sunday is a fantastic day for us to be reminded of the resurrection, of the good news. And it helps us to focus on the person and the work of Jesus. So you have in your outline there, you have the person. We want to start with that. And what do we mean by person? We're talking about and speaking about who Jesus is. Well, how much information about Jesus do we need to know? How much can we know? And the Apostle John begins, I shouldn't say he begins, but he closes off his entire gospel. In John 20, verse 30, he says, Truly, Jesus did many other signs in the presence of his disciples, which are not written in this book. So Jesus did more than we know. Everything is not recorded of what Jesus did. Wouldn't you like to know more of what Jesus did in his life? I would like to know what he did in his childhood or in his teen years. I think that'd be pretty spectacular. I would like to know what his childhood was like because he has brothers and sisters. I wonder what that was like. Well, what specifically are we to believe about Jesus? Well, the Gospel of John begins by giving us an idea of what we should believe about Jesus. So open your Bibles to the Gospel of John. We're not going to be able to go through the entire book, but John just starts off by introducing us to who Jesus is. And right off the bat, he says, In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. He was in the beginning, he who was in the beginning was God, and all things were made through him, and without him nothing was made that was made. So right off the bat, he's saying, hey, let me introduce to you the word. And the word is eternal. I'm like, okay. So what does that tell me about who Jesus is? Jesus is the word, but so he is eternal. And if I continue going down, let me say a little bit more. In, in chapter 1, verse 11, it says, And he came to his own, and his own did not receive him. But as many as received him, to them he gave the right to become the children of God, to those who believe in his name. So right off the bat, we're told that not only is he eternal, but he has the ability to give eternal life. So whoever this Jesus is, he's eternal, and he has the power to give people eternal life. We move a little bit further to verse 14. And the word became flesh and dwelt among us, and we beheld his glory, the glory of the only begotten of the Father, full of grace and truth. So this eternal being took on flesh. What? So God became man. We call him the God-man. And we beheld his glory. That's not... We saw the shininess around his face. It means we saw his character. We saw his godly character. We recognized it for what it is. And there's none like it. There is much more for us to say and recognize. But here is what John is introducing us to. Would you like to know who Jesus is? Let me tell you who Jesus is. And this is impressive and should be impressive impressive to us. Because throughout this entire book, John is trying to say, let me tell you who Jesus is as the God-man. And as you put that in the back of your mind, you are quickly turned to focus on all the things that he did. Because throughout his work, we witness his his person and his divine personhood. For Jesus did things that only God could do. We went back to chapter 20, verse 31. It says, But these things are written that you may believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God, and that believing you may have life in his name. Well, what did Jesus do? We look at the works of Jesus. And again, I don't have time to fully go through every single thing that Jesus did. But the signs that Jesus performed are miracles that point to the person and to the work. Do we need to believe every single work that Jesus did? Do we need to know every single work that Jesus did? Well, of course not, because we can't. 
But when we do see these miracles, we should believe them because they point out that he's God. Only he can do those things. And they draw us to him. Now, the Gospel of John only really highlights seven miracles. You say, that's a lot of chapters for seven miracles. But they are. So I'm just going to rapidly go through them. The first miracle is Jesus turning water into wine. And you know the response of the disciples? They believed. Wow. Well, what did they believe? Did they believe that he was the Messiah? Or did they just believe that he's the one who turned the water into wine? The second miracle that takes place is the emphasis on the, on the spoken word of Jesus. Remember the, the man, the noble man comes to him and says, I have a son who's sick. Can you come with me and come heal my son? And Jesus says, just go on your way. Your son is made well. And the nobleman recognizes at the same time that Jesus said, your son is healed. Huh, that's when his son was healed. Jesus just needs to speak the word and it's done. The third sign that's pointed out there is we're dealing with, uh, in chapter 5, verse 6, he's just pointing out to the fact of healing a man by, that's a crippled by the pool of Bethesda. Beset, and there this man has been crippled for a long time and he needs to get to the water, but everyone beats him to it. And the whole idea is that maybe if I get to the water, I can be healed. And yet in this entire story, Jesus says, do you want to be healed? And the guy goes, yeah, I would like to be here, but I can never get in there in time. But Jesus heals him. And all we see is the grace of God because nowhere in the story do we find that the man believes in Jesus. The fourth sign in here is the feeding of the 5,000. The fifth sign, we see Peter walking on water. The sixth sign, we see that there's a blind man that was born this way from birth. And it's really just designed to show the spiritual truth that's taking place. You could be fully sighted and still not see the truth. And here's a blind man that recognizes the truth. Of course, the seventh sign is Lazarus, who's raised from the dead. Started off with that. Whose sisters go, we know that you could have fixed this if you had been here. And Jesus calls Lazarus from the tomb. Lazarus, come forth. And he does. But yet all these signs point to this one big sign, the sign that we're here for today, the resurrection. Does Jesus have the power over death? Can he do the impossible? Yes, he can work and do things in other people's lives. But does he really have the power over death? In John chapter 10, verse 18, it says, No one takes it from me, meaning my life, but I lay it down, I lay it down of myself, and I have the power to lay it down, and I have the power to take it up again. And yet, when Christ appears to his disciples later on in John chapter 20, they're all amazed that he's there. And he speaks to them a little bit. There's only 11 of them there. And Thomas is not there either. And it's like, why is Thomas not there? A week goes by, then Thomas is there. And I'm sure you you know what took place, and I'm sure you know the story, and you've heard this before. The disciples are so excited, and they tell Thomas, we've seen the Lord, he is raised from the dead, and this is such a glorious thing. And Thomas is like, unless I can put my fingers here and here, that's the only way I am going to believe. And unfortunately, Thomas has gotten the idea or gotten the nickname throughout history as Doubting Thomas. But was he really doubting? Maybe. I don't know. Or maybe is he just so shooken because he put all his hope in Jesus and he thought Jesus was going to establish his kingdom. And then he died. Even though many times Jesus said, I'm going to go to Jerusalem and I'm going to die. He just didn't really hear what he said he was going to do. But what is worth our attention, what is amazing, is that eight days afterwards, Jesus appears to the disciples. This time, Thomas is with him. And Jesus says, peace 
be to you. And he speaks to Thomas and says, reach your fingers here and look at my hands and reach your hand here and put it into my side and do not be unbelieving, but be believing. Be convinced, Thomas. Believe that I am alive. I'm not dead. You see, there are some things that no matter what you say to somebody, no matter how good of an argument that you have, you cannot convince somebody that Jesus is resurrected from the dead. The disciples could not convince Thomas that he was alive. Now, there are people who will accept Jesus as a historical figure, like Abraham Lincoln or George Washington. They will even acknowledge that this guy, he must have done miraculous things, that they can't explain how he did those things. But they cannot put their belief in someone that 2,000 years ago can give them eternal life. They cannot put faith and be convinced that Christ is truth. They cannot believe that the same person paid for their sins by dying on a cross 2,000 years ago. That seems like a big ask, a leap of faith, blind trust. But faith is to be convinced by conviction of truth. It takes the work of God to cause a person to believe in the resurrection. It took the work of Christ to convince Thomas to believe. Stop being unbelieving and believe. It is my prayer today that if you are here and you are unbelieving, that you would be believing in Jesus today as your Lord and your God, as your Savior, just as Thomas did. He's not standing here where I can say, well, put your fingers in here and believe. But the Word of God points that He is alive forevermore. And there is the blessing that comes with believe in Him. Christ said, Blessed are those who have not seen and yet have believed. This blessing is for you today if you've already received Christ as your Savior. If you've never done so, this blessing awaits you. 